One of my favorite artists is the Russian mystical painter and theosophist Nicholas Rerich. He was strongly influenced by the new romantic interest in nature and also contributed his own genius and religious philosophy to his works, forming an independent style. This painting is called Battle in the Heavens. However, this mythical title, hearkening back to the culture of ancient Greece, does not refer to any classical anthropomorphic gods representing the battle. Let me explain. Battle in the Heavens is a reference to ancient Greek religion. The Greeks believed that any time there was turmoil in the world, for example, a storm, a flood, or even a human conflict such as a war, that the gods were most likely responsible for it and fighting with each other in the sky. It's important to understand how this reflects a distinctly polytheistic conception of the cosmos, where different gods compete with each other to get their way, causing similarly confusing and specific events on earth. Each god is responsible for his or her own actions, rather than one god acting autonomously, all-knowing and responsible for everything that happens on earth. This would be the monotheistic idea. To explain further about the way the Greeks saw their gods, I'm going to read this short description from this webpage. To show how human-like the gods were, the Olympian gods had the same inclinations and the same desires, the same flaws and strengths as the mortals, even sometimes living in similar conditions. They looked like humans, but they were almost always prettier and stronger than humans. The gods could be transformed as they wished, or teleported to any place they wished to. This was also a motivation for the famous Greek hospitality, which was a very important institution in ancient Greece. The Greeks would always welcome with special joy any foreigner who could, after all, be a god in disguise. As can be seen from many myths, the gods of the Greeks were not indifferent to humans. On the contrary, they often came in contact with them, traveling secretly, transforming themselves into ordinary people, rewarding the good and punishing the unjust. The gods did not find a better way to be happy than to live as humans, but they were freed from two great sufferings of mankind, the fear of deprivation and the fear of death. Indeed, the privilege of the gods is carefree, they never think about illness, old age, or death. The nectar, the wine of the gods, and ambrosia, the divine food of Olympus, ensure beauty, health, and happiness for the immortals. Going back to the painting, again, without any classical human-like gods representing the battle, as would be per the classical art tradition, there's something less anthropocentric going on. The forces of nature controlling the weather are not shown in the form of human gods, but understood as the physical and natural processes themselves. It seems to me that the artist was trying to use different hues and the complex texture of the clouds themselves, which makes it a true study of nature, to signify this battle in the heavens. He could only do this in an age where nature was being studied and depicted again for its own sake in the Romantic era. A legendary old art historian by the name of Alois Regal explains this entire progression from the point of view of religion, from what he called antique anthropomorphic polytheism, to our current natural scientific worldview, which has remained in power since the start of the Renaissance. This focus on the reality of natural processes, reinterpreting the mythical Greek causality of human-like gods and goddesses creating all our natural events, represents that advanced human stage of understanding that Regal actually credited the Greeks for inventing. By grasping each force of nature individually and seeing them as coordinating amongst themselves. This translates exactly into our actual system of Western science. It in a sense is a belief system as well, with a certain framework through which we understand the world, which is of course culturally derived. This is from Regal's chapter, Classical Polytheism to the Hellenistic Age. Quote, from the outset, anthropomorphic polytheism recognized only material forces, no spiritual ones and therefore no moral ones. In contrast to its oriental counterpart, it grasped the forces of nature individually and sought to coordinate them amongst themselves. Polytheism thus came to an ever sharper differentiation of natural forces, much more sharply and thence to an ever greater multitude of deities, 
each of whom enjoyed equally a certain independence and freedom of movement. The Greeks did not feel pressured to place all their gods under the domination of a single supremely strong figure. Although one higher ruler, Zeus, did exist in the heavenly sphere, there was room alongside him for the activity of countless others. One therefore did not need to turn to Zeus on every occasion, but could summon other gods individually, according to the natural power that one needed. In this way, Greek mythology was gradually transformed into something akin to a natural scientific universal system. For example, Aeolus is the god of the winds. Today we would say the law of air currents. What we call laws or principles, the Greeks could call only a god. All their observations of nature they animated through the cult of divinity. A more specific example. One witnesses a lightning bolt spare a house at the edge of a forest over which a storm is passing. The ancient Greek assigned meaning to that natural event in the following way. This particular spot is especially pleasant to Jupiter Tonans. He spared the house because its owner had dedicated a nearby grove to him. Today we would draw on the laws of causality, arguing that electrical forces surging outward through the tips of the trees prevented the lightning bolt from striking the house. This means that polytheism, as the Greeks understood it, led inevitably to the investigation of individual forces of nature, and thus, as it continued in that direction, to our own natural sciences. To ancient people, not only the Greeks, the individual natural force was always personified, these groups could not imagine a power that did not arrive from an individual presence, that is, from a person. So you see, the polytheistic worldview of the Greeks is at heart very closely related to our own. It too led to an efflorescence of natural scientific study, especially in Alexandria during the age of the Diadochi. There's another artist I found recently who struck me because he actually portrays the exact same worldview in his paintings. Coming out of the Soviet Union, artist Golobokov continues this tradition I'm talking about, but to an even higher level. His art is like a cosmic mythology of life, as created by a utopian race of divine beings, like the Olympian gods, using man-made science to invent and to control the organic. So in this sense, it's almost coming full circle to the point where Western science is inventing the organic itself. We are the creators of the universe, rather than the natural world giving birth to our conceptions of scientific processes. This is probably its final destination in Western culture. Also, see the parallels to classical themes. Because it's such a deep part of our culture, many images recall this battle of the heavens derived from the Greeks. This painting shows yet another contrast between futuristic and archaic, looking like it's resurrecting a woolly mammoth.